Hello and welcome to the series live from Islamabad. I'm Jawad Tehami and these are the headlines. The Afghan army has urged residents of Lashkar Ga city to evacuate ahead of an operation against the Taliban. According to the UN, 40 civilians were killed and more than 100 wounded in the past day amid intense fighting in the besieged city. The Taliban have reportedly captured most of the city. The U.S. has appreciated Pakistan's efforts to advance the Afghan peace process and stability in South Asia. At a briefing, U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price said Pakistan has much to gain from the Afghan peace and it has a critical role in supporting the outcome. He added that Washington will continue to work closely with its Pakistani partners in this regard. Pakistan has condemned custodial deaths and extrajudicial killings of Kashmiris by Indian occupation forces. In a statement, the Foreign Office said over 100 Kashmiris have been killed during the current year alone. This comes hours after Indian forces martyred a civilian during a so-called cordon and search operation in Bandipura district. The United Arab Emirates has decided to lift a ban on transit flights from India, Pakistan and other countries from Thursday. Meanwhile, authorities in the Chinese city of Wuhan will begin testing its entire population after a handful of coronavirus cases were detected there. The city of 11 million people shot into the spotlight after the virus was first detected there in 2019. Those were the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. The Afghan army has urged the residents of the Lashkar Ga city to evacuate ahead of an operation against the Taliban. According to the UN, 40 civilians were killed and more than 100 wounded in the past day amid intense fighting in the besieged city. The Taliban are reported to have captured most of the city. If Lashkar Ga fell, it would be the first provincial capital won by the Taliban since 2016 when they briefly held the northern city of Kunduz. Earlier, the U.S. and Britain embassies accused the Taliban of massacring civilians in southern Spinboldak city. However, the Taliban refuted the accusations, calling them baseless. And for more on this, we are joined by Mr. Mohammad Ayaz Wazir, former ambassador to Afghanistan. Mr. Wazir, thank you very much for your time at this News. First of all, with Afghan air power now under attack, is the U.S.'s over-the-horizon capability enough to prevent Afghanistan from plunging into another widespread decade-long civil war? Well, uh, you know, America has already declared that, well, we are taking the... Uh, troops out of Afghanistan, but not abandoning Afghanistan. So they will try, according to the agreement that they had signed with Afghanistan's government, I think, in 2014 or 15, the security pact. Under that also, they are required to pr provide security to the Afghan government. So they will try to uh, make it uh, uh, extremely difficult for the Taliban to walk in into major cities. Uh, so I think the American will do their uh, utmost uh, to prevent a uh, civil war kind of a situation in, Amer in Afghanistan. Mr. Wazir, how crucial is the battle for Helmand's provincial capital, both strategically and symbolically? Well, it's extremely important. Uh, Helmand was the focus of uh, the NATO uh, uh, forces, particularly the British, when they were here. Uh, and that was uh, shown as a role model during that time. So if that falls, the next would obviously be uh, Kandahar, which is uh, which they, they would make a, 
uh, uh, capital, which was all uh, 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 in their previous uh, term a capital loss, so that will have much more symbolic value than Helmand even. So Helmand will open the floodgate for taking the other close by uh, provinces. Uh, Mr. Wazir, President Ashraf Ghani has now started blaming the U.S. for the situation in Afghanistan after trillions of dollars and extensive training and equipment. Do you believe the criticism by him is valid? Well, I would say both needs to be criticized for the situation in Afghanistan. Ashraf Ghani and America both. They were uh, hand in glove in the situation over there. The American decided to go out after the 20 years leaving Afghanistan in complete uh, mess. There is no uh, real system that can control the whole country. Some is controlled by the Afghan government and the rest is controlled by the Taliban and they are fighting. The Americans should not have left this way. They should have worked on patch up between the two for some future dispensation so that the bloodshed that we can see or we are afraid of that it will take place that could have been easily avoided. So both are, both are I, I would say, to, to be blamed for the mess in Afghanistan. Mr. Mohammad Ayaz Vazi, thank you very much for talking to you in this news. We really appreciate that. And now moving on, the U.S. has appreciated Pakistan's efforts to advance the Afghan peace process and stability in South Asia. U.S. State Department spokesperson said Pakistan has much to gain from the Afghan peace and it has a critical role in supporting the outcome. At a briefing, Ned Price said Washington will continue to work closely with its Pakistani partners in this regard. Price also accused the Taliban of committing outrageous and atrocious acts of violence. The spokesperson called on the Taliban to stop their attacks if they truly support a negotiated settlement. Earlier, a U.S. senator said Islamabad has played an important role in bringing the Taliban to the negotiating table. In an interview, Christopher Juan Hollen said it is neither in Pakistan nor in the U.S. interest to see chaos in Afghanistan. And for more on this, we are joined by Mr. Rustam Shah Mohammed, a political analyst. Mr. Rustam, thank you very much for your time at Indus News. Pakistan has been the frontline state in both the U.S. war on terror and now the push for peace in Afghanistan. Do you believe that Washington and the international community have done enough to acknowledge, appreciate and highlight Islamabad's commitment and efforts? Not really. I mean, uh, Pakistan has paid a high price uh, for its uh, involvement um, in Afghanistan and I think that was a strategically wrong decision by then President Musharraf uh, to get Pakistan engaged in a war uh, with such a high cost and such a lot of instability, particularly in the border areas. Uh, Pakistan has sacrificed a lot. Uh, but the international community, under pressure from Washington, has uh, not tried to <clears throat> appreciate uh, the contribution that Pakistan has made, sacrifices that Pakistanis have made, and the impact on Pakistan's economy of an unwarranted and unnecessary war that was imposed on Afghanistan, and from the effects of which Afghanistan and Pakistan have suffered for the last 20 years. So, Mr. Mohammed, despite Prime Minister Imran Khan's repeatedly saying that Pakistan does not enjoy an overruling leverage over the Taliban, especially after the U.S. exit, Washington is continuously asking Pakistan to do more to help clear the mess created by the Pentagon itself. Do you believe it is a fair approach? As far as the core and uh, strategic decisions are concerned, the Taliban take their own decisions. They will not accept dictation for Pakistan. They have deep grievances against Pakistan. Pakistan was the country which helped to destroy their government in 2001. And the Taliban have never forgotten and have never forgiven Pakistan's role in dismantling their government and their system in 2001. 
Mr. Momin, the situation in Afghanistan is apparently spiraling out of control. Is there any hope for a peaceful political settlement between the Afghan government led by Ashraf Ghani and the Taliban? Uh, no, not really. Uh, the biggest impediment to peace is the Ghani government itself because they want reconciliation which would continue uh, which would seek to continue this present system the Taliban would just come on board they will be mainstreamed in, in the in Afghanistan's politics but the government of Ashraf Ghani would remain in power that is absolutely not acceptable to Taliban in any settlement in any reconciliation the Ashrafani's government will have to go, and a broad-based, multi-ethnic uh, transition government will have to be instituted, will have to be formed, and that can be formed only by the Grand Assembly, or uh, Jirga, which would be convened, which will represent all factions, all parties, all provinces, all ethnicities, and that is a historic um, Afghanistan institution, and it's a long uh, historic tradition in Afghanistan. The Loe Jirga or the Grand Assembly's decisions would be accepted by everybody. And that is the only way out of this impasse, of this deadlock that confronts now and that could now spiral into a civil war in Afghanistan. Uh, but the Afghan government wants to protect itself. They are more keen on protecting uh, their, their own turf rather than keeping the country united. That approach is not going to help. The Americans are not. Uh, bringing enough pressure to bear upon the Kabul government to make room for a transitional government in the interest, in the larger interest of Afghanistan's unity and stability. Uh, and without that, the Afghan government uh, would not be willing to, 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 to be sidelined. Now, if that doesn't happen, then of course uh, the Taliban would keep advancing and uh, uh, taking and capturing more and more territory. But that would come at the cost of a lot of uh, uh, fatalities, uh, both from the Taliban and the Afghan army, and also the civilian population, which will bear the brunt of the civil war uh, if and when that begins. The signs are that uh, the regional militias, which have been established now, which have been created with the help of the government, would be a recipe for a civil war, and that could be disastrous. Mr. Rustam Shah Mohammed, thank you very much for talking to Indies News. We really appreciate that. And now, moving on, Pakistan has condemned custodial deaths and extrajudicial killings of Kashmiris by Indian occupation forces. The statement from the Foreign Office comes after Indian forces martyred another civilian in Bandipura district. Last week, Indian troops killed a 50-year-old civilian inside the army camp in the Tarbal area. According to the Pakistan Foreign Office, over 100 Kashmiris have been killed during the current year alone. It called on the international community to hold India accountable for its grave human rights violations in Kashmir. It also reiterated its call for an international probe into custodial deaths and extrajudicial killings of Kashmiris. Pakistan has rejected India's claim that occupied Jammu and Kashmir was its integral part. Islamabad's envoy to the United Nations, Munir Akram, says the valley is UN-recognized disputed territory. In a tweet, Akram said Security Council's resolutions calling for a plebiscite in the occupied Kashmir remain in force. He said New Delhi's move of revoking the valley's special status violates Council's resolutions and, hence, India's unilateral and illegal actions of the 5th of August 2019 are null and void. Akram noted a dialogue between New Delhi and Islamabad will be productive once India reverses its move and rescinds the demographic changes initiated in the valley and halts its rights abuses in occupied Kashmir. Iran's president-elect Ibrahim Raisi says his government will take steps to lift tyrannical sanctions imposed by the U.S. He made the remarks at a ceremony where the supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, endorsed his mandate as the eighth Iranian president. Raisi is scheduled to be sworn in on 5th of August. He pledged that his administration will not let Iranians' livelihood be dependent on the enemy's will. Meanwhile, Khamenei said Tehran is ready to take leaps towards progress. He said the nation is longing to receive services from officials. 
The UN has reiterated that Israel's settlement activities, including evictions and demolitions, are illegal under international law. UN Secretary General Spokesperson Stefan Dujeric made the remarks at a press briefing. Dujeric said the UN is watching closely Israeli Supreme Court's proceedings on Sheikh Jarrah expulsion case. Earlier, Israel's top court offered the four Palestinian families a so-called protected status. Under this status, the families are supposed to live in their own homes as tenants. Their properties will have Israeli ownership and they will have to pay a symbolic annual rent. However, Palestinian families have rejected the proposal. The U.S. says it is confident that Iran attacked an Israeli oil tanker last week off Oman that killed two crew members. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. has conducted a thorough review of the incident. Blinken said the U.S. is in close contact with the U.K., Israel, Romania and others and there will be a collective response. In a press briefing, he said Iran's action is a direct threat to freedom of navigation and commerce. He said there is no justification for this attack on a peaceful vessel on a commercial mission in international waters. Meanwhile, the UK and Iran have summoned each other's diplomats in the row. Tehran denies involvement in the attack and has vowed to crushingly respond if its interests are threatened. A Belarusian activist living in exile in Ukraine was found hanged in a park near his home in Kiev. Vitaly Shishov was the head of the Kiev-based non-profit organization that helps Belarusians fleeing persecution. He was reported missing on Monday after he did not return from a run and could not be reached on his mobile phone. Police said they have launched a criminal case for suspected murder. They said they are also investigating whether killers tried to disguise the crime as suicide. Ukraine's foreign ministry said Kiev will do everything possible to fully investigate the death. Meanwhile, Belarus opposition leader Svetlana Tikhonovskaya said the incident might be criminal in nature, but she will wait for the results of the probe. Moscow says the U.S. has asked 24 Russian diplomats to leave the country by 3rd of September after their visas expire. The latest development comes amid heightening tensions between Moscow and Washington. In an interview, Russian ambassador to the U.S. Antony Antonov said almost all of the diplomats will leave as Washington abruptly tightened visa-issuing procedures. He accused the U.S. of applying a restriction of three-year assignment period for Russian diplomats only. Meanwhile, the U.S. State Department rejected the claim, saying Antonov's characterization of the situation is not accurate. At a briefing, spokesperson Ned Price said Washington is not using diplomats' visas to retaliate against Moscow. Seoul, says Pyongyang, wants international sanctions to be lifted in order to restart denuclearization talks with the U.S. A group of South Korean lawmakers was briefed by the country's main intelligence agency. The briefing comes a week after the two Koreas restored hotlines that North Korea suspended a year ago. The lawmakers said North Korean leader Kim Jong-un requested South to reconnect hotlines. They said two Koreas have shared a willingness to rebuild trust and improve ties since April. The lawmakers noted Pyongyang is in need of some 1 million tons of rice as coronavirus pandemic and bad weather battered its economy. More stories to follow right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. South Korea has detected its first cases of new Delta Plus variant of COVID-19. The virus has claimed more than 4.2 million lives globally and has infected nearly 199 million others. More in this report. A fierce surge by the Delta variant is swamping hospitals across the world once again. The U.S. states of Florida and Louisiana are at record levels of hospitalizations, while doctors warned of the darkest days yet. Meanwhile, Cuba has completed a vaccination drive in the capital, Havana. 
Y una noticia particular que... Our positive piece of news that we have today is that we have concluded with the vaccination process in Havana's 15 municipalities. More than 1,355,000 people have been vaccinated. This is a very important feat and has involved a praiseworthy and big effort from all structures. There has been an important participation from all of the government structures. The German government condemned the violence at protests in Berlin where police arrested over 600 people and a man died after being detained. Germany plans to offer booster shots to vulnerable people from September, as well as offer vaccinations to children over 12. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he wants to get the travel industry moving again with a simple, user-friendly system. This comes amid rising disapproval of Britain's 10-day quarantine requirement among travellers from Europe. We are going to England to see our children whom we haven't seen since Christmas in 2019. And to go there we must observe a 10-day quarantine with two PCR tests after the end of the 10 days. This is extremely difficult, especially the forms to fill up for the British government. Meanwhile, things are happening in silence between Britain and France. Our children, who are meant to see us at home, will not be coming due to the imposed quarantine for those coming to France. It's absolutely ridiculous. Serbia is benefiting from quarantine tourism as thousands of Indians make a two-week stopover on the way to other countries. Meanwhile, Japan has threatened to publicly shame the people not complying with coronavirus border control measures. It will also shift policy to focus on hospitalizing patients who are seriously ill to avoid strain on the medical system. COVID-19 has claimed another 67 lives in Pakistan over the past 24 hours. The health ministry says the death toll has risen to 23,529. It said the virus infected nearly 3,600 people overnight. The positivity rate of cases has declined to 7.19%. The ministry said the number of active cases has topped 75,000. Nearly 3,400 of them are in critical condition. Pakistan has reported more than 1,043,000 cases so far, while over 944,000 people have recovered from the disease. Turkey's President Tayyip Erdogan has stressed the importance of the continuation of the Tunisian parliament for the country's democracy. In a phone call with his Tunisian counterpart, Kai Said, Erdogan said Tunis's democracy must be protected and its freedoms must be guaranteed. In a statement, Turkey's presidency said Erdogan asserted that Tunisian stability is extremely important for the regional well-being. He said Ankara is carefully following the developments in Tunisia. Meanwhile, President Said removed finance as well as communications and technologies ministers from their positions. He sacked Prime Minister Hisham Michichi and suspended the parliament for 30 days on 25th of July. Human Rights Watch says some Lebanese officials knew about the risks posed by ammonium nitrate stored at the Beirut port. Last year, the explosion at the port killed more than 200 people, injured thousands and destroyed swathes of Lebanon's capital. Its investigation concluded there was evidence that multiple authorities were criminal, criminally negligent under Lebanese law. In its report, the watchdog said President Michel On, caretaker Prime Minister Hassan Diab and other former ministers failed to act despite having been informed of the risks. It called on the UN Human Rights Council to mandate an investigation into the blast. The body urged for foreign governments to impose human rights and corruption sanctions on the country's officials. The U.S. has begun returning more than 17,000 ancient artifacts looted and smuggled out of Iraq following the American invasion in 2003. According to Iraq's Minister of Culture, the U.S. handed over some of the antiquities to Iraq, while others will be returned in the next month. This will include a 3,500-year-old clay tablet bearing part of the epic of the Gilgamesh. The Sumerian tale is considered one of the world's first pieces of literature.
In the U.S., two more Washington, D.C. police officers who responded to 6th January's Capitol riot have committed suicide. Police say four officers have taken their own lives to date since the attack by a pro-Trump mob. According to the Metropolitan Police, Officer Gunther Hashida was found dead at his home on Thursday, while Officer Kilde Freytag was found dead on the 10th of July. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi also offered condolences on behalf of all the members of the chamber. More than 100 D.C. and Capitol Police officers were injured while defending the Capitol on 6th of January. A House Select Committee is currently investigating the attack. In Israel, a large wildfire has broken out in a forest on the outskirts of Jerusalem, forcing the evacuation of dozens of families. The local fire chief said the blaze was likely started by people uh, rather than the weather. He said 11 firefighting units are working to contain the blaze. Local media reported that the fire has spread over an area of around 24 acres. In June, several fires erupted in areas near Jerusalem, forcing the evacuation of homes. Over 10,000 people have been evacuated from the Turkish province of Mogula to escape the deadly wildfires. Due to record-breaking heat wave covering much of the southeastern Europe, wildfires have wreaked havoc across Turkey, Italy and Greece. Firefighters from the European Union along with local volunteers have been fighting fires near the coastline for the seventh day. A terrorist group called Children of Fire has claimed the responsibility for the Turkey forest fires. Meanwhile, Italian firefighters are using helicopters to fight fires along the Italy's Adriatic coast and Sicily regions. In Greece, emergency teams across the country are battling to get hundreds of wildfires under control. Four-year-old piano prodigy uh, Rigid Shea has become one of the youngest people to play at Carnegie Hall, a major concert venue in Midtown Manhattan in New York. More about the pint-sized pianist in this report. On a breezy afternoon in downtown Stamford, a group of children from 4 to 12 years old in fancy dresses and suits held an outdoor piano recital outside of a steakhouse. Bridget Shee's feet dangle above the ground when she sits on the piano bench, moving her hands across the keyboard. Her fingers glide somewhat effortlessly over an out-of-tune piano with the key sometimes sticking. Shee's father signed her up for piano lessons on Zoom about a year ago to give her something to do during COVID-19 lockdown. Bridget uh, came to me and uh, when she was uh, just two months after three years old and I, from the lessons, I observed she has a curious mind and she, she, has, uh, she loved to learn, so that's what we, we call the passion. She is also the youngest winner of the prestigious Elite International Music Competition and her mother gives credit to her teacher Felicia Zhang. In the same piano recital, 12-year-old Carrie Wang's hands flew across the piano as she poured emotion into Chopin's revolutionary etude. Wang has been playing since he was five years old, and his piano teacher, Felicia Feng Zhang, taught him to express himself through music. She wants me to get, like, what I'm feeling through this piece, what this piece reminds me of. And for example, that piece that I just did, Revolutionary Age, it's basically, I looked at the analysis, it's sort of like the revolution, it's a war between Poland and Russia. So I need to interpret the sound of the war into the piece. And that's basically what she's been te teaching me a lot. Wang has played at Carnegie Hall six times and is currently enrolled in Manhattan School of Music. It's time for a short break. We'll be back with more stories. Stay tuned. In other business updates, the International Monetary Fund has officially approved increasing its lending capacity by $650 billion. This was the last step in approving an initiative to boost aid to the most vulnerable countries. 
Fund's head, Kristalina Georgieva, said the decision is the largest special drawing rights allocation in the history of IMF. In a statement, she said it is a shot in the arm for the global economy during an unprecedented crisis. Georgieva noted the move will help countries most vulnerable to the COVID-19. Member countries will be allocated increased lending capacity as per IMF quota. Meanwhile, emerging and developing nations will receive around $275 billion in total. The program, which was approved by the Funds Executive Board in mid-July, will be implemented on the 23rd of August. The Wall Street stocks have dropped as concerns about global growth and COVID variants kept investors on the edge. Stronger than expected profit reports from the U.S. companies in recent weeks have ratcheted up already high market forecasts. The Nasdaq Composite traded a quarter of a percent lower, while the S&P 500 was also down marginally. The DJI index traded at a fraction up. Meanwhile, the oil prices slide after an early bounce on demand worries. And now for weather updates, we have Naila with us. Thank you. We're going to start off with Abu Dhabi, where the weather is expected to be extremely hot, with temperatures rising to 43 degrees Celsius. While in Amsterdam, a thin veil of clouds are rolling across the sky, with temperatures at 20 degrees Celsius. If we head to Ankara, the weather is sunny, with temperatures around 37 degrees Celsius. Moving down under to Auckland, the temperature is chilly at 14 degrees Celsius, with some raindrops in the forecast. Now, if you are traveling to Bangkok, there will be cloudy weather, with temperatures around around 32 degrees Celsius. In Beijing, clouds are veiling the sun with temperatures at 30 degrees Celsius, while Beirut will be experiencing some sunny weather with temperatures at 32 degrees Celsius. Berliners will be experiencing temperatures at 21 degrees Celsius with some clouds, making the weather even more pleasant. Heading to Cairo, the hot sun will be out with temperatures at around 40 degrees Celsius. Down under in Canberra, the temperatures are at 11 degrees Celsius and a few drops of rain are expected. In Islamabad, the temperatures are at 34 degrees Celsius, accompanied by a thin line of white puffy clouds. While in Jakarta, the temperatures are steady at 32 degrees Celsius with some rain in the forecast. That's all we have for now. Back to you. Thank you. That is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indistot News.